This is the Intuitive Leadership Mastery Podcast. What would it take for you to double your profits and half your stress with your intuition? Learn how with your host, Michael Light. Hi, welcome back. We're here with Taylor Pearson, author of the best-selling book, End of Jobs. Taylor, tell us about uh, intuition in your business. Yeah, so when I think about intuition in my business, the first thing that comes to mind is this idea I started playing with maybe a year and a half or two years ago, I call uh, founder product market fit. So you hear a lot of talk if you listen to the lean startup world and all this I, about kind of product market fit. You know, I have this product and how do I get to the point where it's a good fit with the market? But the question that very rarely gets asked is, you know, am I the founder or am I the person, am I a good fit for this market and am I a good fit uh, for this product? And those are very intuitive questions. Right. So, uh, one of the questions I've asked myself when it comes to my good fit for this market is, you know, think about who your ideal customer avatar is. I think of a specific person who might be a customer for this product, and you're walking down the beach on vacation um, with your family or your friends, and you see them, and they're on the beach and they're walking towards you. How does that make you feel? Are you excited? Oh, I, I haven't seen Brett in forever, and we get to catch up, and this is great. Or, you know, I hope each turns around, or I'm going to hide behind this shrub, uh, or I'm going to shield my face when I'm walking by, right? And you, you sort of get this sense for, okay, do I actually want to, is this a market I'm excited about serving? I remember there's a story from uh, Steve Blank, who's one of the very early um, founders of what's now called Lean Startup. Um, I think he, he had a book called Four Steps to the Epiphany. Uh, he told an example, he started a company making uh, video games. Uh, for teenage boys and he'd done the market analysis it was a great market it was going very quickly um, and he realized that the one problem with the business was he hated all his customers mm. he mostly wanted his customers to go away and so they did <laughs> uh, and so it turned out to be a very very bad business it was a very good business for someone else but it was a very bad business because it was a bad founder fit with the market right it wasn't you know he wasn't really excited about making video games for teenage boys so how how did taken to find this out that his business was growing and crashed? I think about two or three years. And how much did money did he lose on this deal? Millions of dollars, I don't know how much. And if he just visualized on this visualization exercise he was suggesting where he saw the teenage boys walking down the beach, and would he like, wow, yeah, teenage boys, let me go talk to them, games, or he's hiding from them. Right, it's a, it was a $2 million lesson to understand the best in I think a five-minute visualization exercise is probably worth $2 million. It is. It seems much less expensive. <laughs> Cool. And then you said you also found a product fit. So where, how do you work on that part of the triangle? So I tend to think about what does what does the day to day of running this business look like. So um, what do I enjoy doing day to day? What am I good at day to day? And what does this day to day business require? So. Um, I I am competent, although not good at sales, but I don't the idea of waking up and doing sales all day every day is not super exciting to me. It's occasionally I like to do it um, uh, when it's necessary. And so you know, I, I've had business ideas or I had business opportunities which required someone to there was a it was a sales role, right? You need to go out and what's gonna to take to build this business to a thousand customers, is you're we're gonna hit the phones, you know, we're gonna pull out this customers and we're gonna kinda of call down the list. And I can look at the business and say, this is a great opportunity. This is a great market. It's definitely going very quickly. I have no interest in pursuing it, right? Because um, I'm not going to be very good at it. And I, I most this this particular lesson I learned because I tried. I had a um, marketing agency for a very brief period of time, and what that requires is you do a bunch of sales calls. You get on the phone with people. You do appointments. You do proposals. Um, and I, just, I can hear that in your voice. You went from excited to like, oh god, do I have to do this again? Right. Uh, and so I, didn't, you know, I didn't want to do, uh, I was doing marketing for. Um, so that's another way to take this. You, you're talking about visualizing the tasks you do in that job. Yeah. I'll give you another test to do it. Just talk about doing that job, working with that market, and then make a recording of it, and then listen to the tone of your voice and hear how excited you sound in the recording. And that's a clue for both you uh, and anyone else who's going to be involved. I use that when I'm making investments. I'm in a private investor. 
thing and they bring us offers and they, we get on a telecall and you hear from the CEO or maybe some other people in the company. And I had the experience six months ago or maybe a year ago and they brought on this opportunity. It was going to be, it was bridge loan for this uh, company and it was going to pay 15% interest over six months, which is a 30% APR, which sounded pretty good. And they had all these logical reasons why it was a great deal and like how it was collateral protection and we were ahead of other people and blah, blah, blah. On paper, it looked like a perfect deal, but there was something wrong. That the CEO just didn't sound passionate about it. His legal advisor was on the call. Or something, you know, it was like this guy was Darth Vader in a lawsuit, you know. <laughs> and um, so I didn't do the deal, even though it looked like a, a no-brainer, easy win to make money. Well, they went bankrupt. All the protections that were supposed to be there disappeared. They're now mired in lawsuits. We don't even know if the people who did invest in get the money back. So I'm very glad I listened to my intuition there and listened to whether they had passion. Because, you know, when you invest in a business, you're investing in the people. And I guess in some sense you're evaluating, is there a founder product market fit? How is that triangle uh, set up? There's uh, a book by Jonah Lair called How We Decide mm. that I read. I never, it just came to me as you were uh, talking. Um, he summarizes some research um, and kind of the gist of the research. He summarizes that when you're making a decision with five factors or less, you can make that in a, a very conscious way. So if you're deciding um, like what peanut butter to get and there's two options, you know, is it crunchy or smooth or organic or non-organic, okay, okay, I like organic, crunchy peanut butter. Um, but when you're making a decision with uh, more than five factors, it's usually five or seven factors, um, the best way to do it is you kind of take in all the information. So if you're choosing a car and there's 100 makes and models and there's different colors and there's, you know, 50 features in every car, you got to you look at all the options, you read about them, um, you sleep on it for a few days, and then whatever you're most um, excited about, or whatever your kind of gut sense is, is the one that uh, statistically is the better option. So they've done these like interesting uh, correlations where they, I think they ask for like a brain teaser, and then they have them say, okay, what's your gut sense? Or like explain to us logistically why you think you should make this choice and the logistical people that have to provide this rational explanation uh, I want this car because you know the tax rebate and uh, yada 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 um, actually make less poor decisions and they went back and evaluated and surveyed those people a year later they were less happy um, with their purchase which I've never I don't think he used the word intuition um, but it always made sense to me I've always found it to be a very good kind of rule of thumb for um, is this something I should kind of make from my logical brain do I just say you know crunchy peanut butter or is it something that I should say you know let me sleep on this for two days and see what I really think in my gut yeah, I, know, I think the gut is really smart and it's helpful to get some space to be able to listen to it. And I think another important thing there is not to second guess the initial reaction you have. I mean, that's the thing in the book about uh, Gladwell or Rowe called Blink, where he's saying the initial impression you get is often the true one. And then we try and rationalize it and try and shoehorn in a second guess uh, to change that. So. Um, yeah, sleeping on it, or just what is your initial impression? And something I've found that helps to improve that is to keep the decision journal. So I don't know if you've ever done that, where you keep a record of the decisions you made, and what your reasoning was, what your gut feeling was. Whether or not you listen to your gut, you know, maybe you decided to go ahead with it anyway, and then you see, you go back six months, a year later, and you, you revisit and see, okay, how much was the rational mind contributing? How much was this a good decision overall? And what did I learn from it? So I've, I've started a nine-day planning process. We talked about before, and I've started doing that as a part. You know, mm-hmm. what are the? Actually, I choose my three initiatives for my ten days, and I kind of write a little paragraph on each. You know, why did I choose this one? Why I think it was important. So I have to go back. It'll take me a while to build up enough of a journal to see how my thought process goes, but I'm excited to see what that looks like. That's a great idea. And I know you do a daily um, planning process where you like, what tasks are you doing today? What do you feel grateful for? How do you go? What lessons do you learn? And it would be quite possible to do that on a daily basis. Yeah, like, sure. what did I pick to work on today? How did that work out? What did I do to make it you know, successful? 
do you find, if I can flip the script and ask you a question, do you find, um, I tend to be much, I tend to listen to my gut much more in domains I feel like I have expertise. So if it's like a, a marketing question, I feel like I have pretty good expertise in marketing, I'll kind of listen to my gut. But if it's, um, try to think of a good example, if it's the kind of domain where I have no expertise, I tend to be much more cautious are much more hesitant to listen to what my initial reaction is because I don't even know what I'm talking about. This is kind of a shooting in the dark scenario. Yeah, I don't think we have to know what we're talking about to have good information. So, I mean, you, you mentioned shooting in the dark. I mean, a, an example of that is if you're walking along a street and you get a weird feeling that you shouldn't go down a certain alley, you know, that's, you don't really have detailed information of what's happening down there. You've just got like, hey, there's something weird happening here. I just don't want to go down there. And that's an example of uh, where you don't have the information. You don't really have experience walking out of in Bangkok or wherever you are. And yet you're still getting valuable information. So the same thing in business. You can still get valuable information, even if you don't have deep experience in the field. And in some ways, um, although you may not be able to interpret the information as well as someone who has a lot of experience, because once you've got, if you've got a lot of experience in marketing, you know where to hang the gut feeling onto. But in some ways, you're less corrupted by having all that full pattern of learning getting in the way of, of what the gut's trying to say. Huh. You know, sometimes people who know a lot actually don't make the smart decisions. Have you ever heard of the sophomore slump? No, what's that? So uh, I was a big college football fan growing up, and there's this phenomenon called the sophomore slump. A lot of times you have a freshman player that's really good, mm -hmm. uh, this amazing freshman year, uh, and then just will slump in his sophomore year, and he'll come back his junior and senior year, and he'll be good. But like, very common to have a very strong freshman year, a weak sophomore year, uh, and a strong junior and senior year. And I wonder if that's the they, they start to think about it, or they start to... Maybe they overanalyze yeah. that play. Yeah, yeah. When they were just going with their gut sense of, you know, how do I play their freshman year, they were great, and they had to yeah. kind of go through this period where they were analyze it and get back to where they had been initially. Yeah, I mean, I think sports is a great area for where people do use their intuition, because if you're playing football, you really don't have time to get a spreadsheet out and analyze all of the factors. I mean, obviously, if you could stop time when people froze, right, you could analyze everything and say, okay, this person was like 16.5 yards away from me, and like this person, you know, here's their statistical history of how often they've done this, you could totally analyze it, right? But we don't have time to do that, so you've got to go with what's your instinct. And that, the best football players, the best sports people are able to do that like that. They can immediately figure out what is the thing to do in this moment against this opposition. They just know, yeah. Yeah. And to say, you know, that's in sports. Um, I think the same is true in, in the military. You know, not in the military where they're all on parade, following orders, stepping in time. That's all like rational thought, or maybe it's not even rational thought, but it's not intuitive. But when they get into a battle and they're at war, that's where the soldiers who are able to access their intuition and know that, oops, I need to not step in this direction because there's going to be a bomb that's going to land there in a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And they don't know why, they just don't do that. Uh, or I'm not going to put my foot in this direction because like, it doesn't feel good. And then someone else does that later and there's a mine there and they blow their leg off. So generally successful soldiers are able to access that. Because in, in the fog of war, when there's so much confusion going on, you don't really know what's happening. That's when intuition becomes more powerful. In fact, they did a, I read this, I don't know if it's in Blink or another book, but there was a uh, war game that the Pentagon ran. Uh, quite a few years ago, and I think they spent several hundred million dollars on this war game. And it was against a uh, Middle Eastern country, and so they had to have the red, you know, they had red team, blue team, right? And I think the red team represents the opposition. So they got this, uh, you know, I think he was a major colonel, I feel rank he had, but he'd like been in the Vietnam War, he was, you know, well respected, practical soldier. And then they had all these like analysts and other people in the blue team using all the data capture and resources the US military has. And then within like minutes of starting the, the, the war, right, he'd already confused them as to what was happening and he managed to destroy two of their aircraft. 
aircraft carriers when he wasn't supposed to be able to do that. And they had to stop. They, what they ended up doing, I mean, he won the war game, and then they stopped it and started again and changed all the rules to kind of stop him being able to do this. <laughs> but the truth was that the soldier who was able to use their intuition better actually won. Yeah. So it's, it's not just business. This applies to many other fields. It also applies to medicine. You know, the best doctors are able, they just know something, you know, what is the cause of this illness? And then they order some tests to back it up, right? But really, they, they're following their intuition. That's, I believe it. Yeah. No. It's, it's really interesting. So the same thing with your, your founder product market fit. You know, you're asking, if you're, if you're evaluating yourself, you're saying, hey, am I a good fit uh, for the market and the product? But if you're doing it intuitively, you can visualize that as a triangle between the F, the founder, the P, and the M, of the, the market, and see how the, what are the four, what are the three sides of that triangle? Are they bright and shiny? Is one of them kind of dull? Is the like uh, is the line connecting the two sides a, a solid line or is it dotted? You know, what information do you get just intuitively evaluating it quickly? So. Oh, that's interesting. I've never. Uh, I'll, I'll try that one next time. Yeah. The idea of just looking at the triangle. What does it look like? Yeah, and then you can do the analysis that you're doing already, or do the visualizations you're doing, and compare them. But it may be you already have the info, and you can get the answer really quickly. Yeah. At least to eliminate some things like eh, no, this doesn't attract. This is a B. Or this is a single line. This isn't good. I'm not even going to delve into this. Yeah. Because I think one of the things that's going on right now is the speed of business. I don't know if you've noticed this, but everything's getting faster. There's more products coming out every year. The product cycle is reduced in time, and technology, there's more technology coming out. So it's just hard to keep up with stuff in business. Especially if you don't like it. <laughs> even more, if you don't like it, it's hopeless. Yeah. But even if you like it, you can't. It's, I, I think it's impossible to keep up with all the change that's happening, and that's one of the reasons why now is the time we need to use our intuition as well as our rational minds in our business. Because if you're going to analyze everything, it's like trying to be the, the football player on the football field, and, and they're like, oh, can you just hold up, guys? I'm just going to analyze this for the next half hour. You know, it's not possible. Yeah. Because the competition is going to run you over. So I, I think it's critical we do use this. And um, where I would like to be, I mean, right now, if you were advising another entrepreneur and they were starting their business and they said, hey, Taylor, I'm just not going to use any spreadsheets. None of my staff in my business will use any spreadsheets in my business because spreadsheets kind of newfangled and a bit weird, you know. And I don't really understand how they work. You know, I know there's some programming behind them, but I don't really, I haven't read the code, you know, and I don't really understand it. So I'm not going to use them. You did them crazy, right? I think in a short amount of time in the future, if an entrepreneur says, oh, we're not going to use intuition in our business, none of my staff will touch that stuff, I don't really understand how it works. People would say, what are you talking about? Yeah. This is a tool, right? Why would you not use a useful tool in your business, even if you don't understand? We use hundreds of tools in our business, particularly technological tools, that we don't really understand, right? Unless you like some coding jockey that yeah. understands how that stuff works. You just know that, hey, I plug stuff in spreadsheets, it helps me plan my business. I uh, do SEO, optimi you know, optimize my pages, I get more traffic, people make more sales. You know, but you don't understand the details of how Google actually sends traffic to you. You just have some like rules of thumb that, yeah, this works. And I think the same thing is with these intuitive tools, like what would it take to connect to the light, the profit and joy graphs, all the other tools. You don't have to understand on a deep level why they work. You just need to know, yeah, it's a useful tool, it's easy to use, I can apply it, I can get stuff done quicker in my business. Well, that's, I think I started to see a phenomenology, I mentioned this when we were talking earlier, but I, I took all the articles uh, I'd written 
over the past three years, and I was trying to analyze which ones did the best, which ones did the worst, and so like, you had a spreadsheet. Yeah, so I pulled out my spreadsheet. How many words did they have? What, how was the title optimized? Exactly. You know, the title, how was the title optimized? What was the subject matter about? What day of the week was it published? What week of the year? Yada yada yada. What did you discover? And the only correlative factor I could figure out was how excited I was when I was writing the essay with how well it was received and how well it performed. And so I think that's uh, that kind of both phenomenology is a little bit my track record, right? You can look back and you can see, okay, I spent three years doing this and like the, the biggest factor for me is how excited am I when I write the post is the most is actually on, you know, I can go back and look at you know, how much revenue it drove or how many visitors it drove, you know, very objective data points, but the kind of input to those right is was I excited about. So this is now a predictive tool for you. Now it's before you write the article, you're asking how excited I am I about this because that predicts how successful it will be in connecting with people for you. Right, so I, I keep a file of about 20 articles that I'm kind of loosely working on, so I'll have an idea and I'll type it up and I'll write a few sentences or a few paragraphs about it, and then when it's time like I've in my publishing schedule to publish something, I'll just kind of scroll down or scan down the 20 and I'll say which of these am I most excited about, and that's what's that. I'm going to work on next. Yeah, so you're feeling where the excitement is, yeah. and that's the one that wants to excite It's almost like the article wants to be written. You know, you're writing the article, but it's also the article that writes you, and it's almost like that article's like, me, 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 Taylor, write me! And you're like, yeah, I feel excited about that. There's, uh, I read Stephen King's book on writing mm. uh, earlier this year, last year, I don't recall. Um, and he was interviewed by a reporter, and I think the reporter asked him, you know, how do you, um, how do you write your books? And he said, I don't write my books. Um, I channel the books. Or the you yeah. write your book, and I kind of go through it. And the reporter goes, you don't really believe that, do you? Um, He's like, I do. Like, you don't have to believe it. But I thought that was interesting. Like, the, yeah. he, he's written so many books, and obviously, he's the best author. Yeah. yeah. Um, but has this sense that you know the idea comes to him, and he's just kind of it's going yeah. through with his fingers on a keyboard, and he's pushing it. Yeah, and then it's easier to write. You know, too. Yeah. I think that's a useful technique, and I've certainly experienced that. And that I think is true of when we're creating businesses. You're coming back to that product market found a fit. In some sense, the business is out there already, and it's just looking for the right combination of market, product, and founder to come together in order for it to be born into the world. Yeah. And part of that equation is how passionate those three products are um, for creating it. So uh, coming back to your picking what uh, essay to write or what task to write on, you, you know, you can take that a step further and look ahead of time, okay, how passionate am I going to feel about doing these things in the future? So we even, you know, cut out writing about them at all until they, they are whatever, excited. And the other thing that occurred to me is that if you have something that, for whatever reason, your rational mind's like, yeah, this would be a good topic, but I don't really don't feel like excited about it, you can, hey, ask yourself on a scale of 0 to 10 how excited I am, where, where 0 is it sucks, and 10 is I'm wildly excited. And suppose it's a 5, and you can say, what would it take to take it to a 6? A 5 to a 6. Okay, oh, maybe I need to tweak it a bit, or maybe I need to interview someone. And then, okay, you go to a six, okay, what would it take to get this from a six to a seven? You get more inspirations. Yeah. And you may be able to bump it up to a ten excitement level just by manipulating it uh, and using what would it take to get more inspiration to adjust it. Or maybe you find you can only get it to an eight and you can't really bump it beyond that, which may or may not be where you want it to be. So, you know, it's not like it's set in stone. The level of excitement is very easy to manipulate. I mean, that's a, uh, I guess that's an LP technique as well. You know, uh, you have, you have a, uh, Daniel P. Tony did, Robbins. I yeah. did, uh, two or three years ago, I read a yeah. bunch of the books. Yeah. So he does, he tells a story where he's with a kid who wants to stop drinking cola or something. And he's like, well, how much do you want to drink this cola right now? And, you know, he says it's like a two out of ten, you know. And he, his scale goes from minus ten to plus ten. And so he, and the kid wants to stop drinking colors, right? So he first of all runs him up all the way to ten out of ten. He's super excited to want to drink it, just to prove to it you can play with this thing. Then he runs him all the way back down to minus ten. Interesting. And then at that point, the colors like 
drinking shit in right. his life. He doesn't want to touch him. Right. Um, so you can adjust how you feel about things. You know, you can take a task, like, I don't want to do my bookkeeping, you know, it's like, ugh, boring, right? But you can make it exciting. Or outsource it. Or you can ask them. Well, that might be the inspiration you get. <laughs> that's might pretty be, true, yeah. yeah. I need to find someone who's really good at this and just pay them to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. You don't need to do everything yourself. And you can use your intuition to stay with to figure out which things are going to give you more joy and profit by outsourcing. Because you can compare the joy and profit graph. Here's the task outsourced. Here's the task for a higher number of staff. Here's the task. Here's the joint profit. If I keep doing it myself, yeah. Here's the joint profit if no one does it. Yeah. Right. Don't forget, there's always an option that no one does the task because that's that's bold. Yes. More frequently, the best option than than the high price. Like, yeah. <laughs> we were talking earlier about email. That oftentimes the best way to respond to an email is just not to respond. Just, just let, it let it go. Yeah. That's a good tip. So cool. Any other ways you use intuition in your business? Or what you want to share today? I don't think so. I think that we've covered it pretty thoroughly. All right. Well, it's great talking with you, Taylor. How would people find you if they wanted to uh, see some of these passion-filled articles that you've curated? Sure. So my website is uh, taylorpearson.me. So it's Taylor as in Taylor Swift. And then Pearson, P E A R S O N, dot M E. Uh, I'm the same on Twitter, at Taylor Pearson Me. Uh, and my email is Taylor at Taylor Pearson dot me. Uh, please do drop me a line. Fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Get strategies and show notes at intuitiveleadershipmastery.com. What would it take to see you here next time on the Intuitive Leadership Mastery Podcast?